stream is about to start We'll talk about code or whatever we'll talk about today It's about to start, so please hang tight while I check that everything is okay Sound, check, camera, check, lights, check How's my hair? Oh, wait, I don't have any hair Maybe put some pants on and I am good to go So get ready wherever you are Cause this stream is about to start Get ready wherever you are Cause this stream is about to start Hi, I am Leonard Facchinetti and welcome to the second meeting of our C++ Digital Signal Processing Juice Study Group. How are you all doing this evening? Well, it's evening for me, but how are you doing today? Hey everyone, pretty good. Awesome. So we have some of the folks from two weeks ago, Fautis and Victor, and uh, I thought that today what we could do is first answer the pressing question of what do we want to do with digital signal processing C++, what is our goal, what is the plugin that we want to develop, what is the algorithm that we want to learn about, um, what is maybe the, the product that we are planning on selling, that sort of thing, and then we definitely to cover questions that we have, like we made some progress over these two weeks, but we probably have more questions now that we have than we have when it started. So we talk, could talk about things that went wrong and things that we don't understand. And then what do we plan on doing for the next two weeks, which is probably gonna be like, do a plugin that is not just a hello world, that is a step towards the thing that we want to build in the end. So. Uh, Fautis, do you want to start us off sharing what you were able to do and did you learn about CLAP and did you decide what plugin you want to develop? Yes, I I did study what is uh, available on CLAP. There is not a lot of documentation currently. The most information that we know about CLAP is uh, from a KVR board. I will talk about it in a minute. And as for what I want to create, I have two goals. The first one is to uh, create a synth that uh, is based on uh, on different uh, modulation and oscillator sources. I basically want to become more efficient with sound synthesis and not relying too much on presets. <laughs> and I want to study how the the various synthesizers work and what makes one different from another. Like why is X person is using Korg and what Y person is using Roland, for instance. And each one of them has their own characteristics and uh, things that make them sound unique. And I want to see the differences and what I can create out of this. So I want to find my sound in all of this. And the second thing I want to make is uh, as for the effect plugins, I would like to make something that has to do with surround sound or maybe something for uh, sonic manipulation and uh, sculpting in the quotes, like uh, something that can transform sound in a playful and interesting manner, in a, like a plugin version of what you can do with extreme uh, manipulators such as uh, pure data, max, or other modular environments. Is this something that you're going to do for your work or? Because I know that you work in this this area, right? Uh, I would like to work on this area. Mm. Yes, I don't actually work in surround sound yet, but I am have been interested for more than fifteen years. I have uh, studied all the formats that have been available, and now with the object oriented stuff, it's very interesting how you you can. Uh, 
apply this new found technology in, in VST and it hasn't been explored that much yet. Mm-hmm. And do you own but this I, I, synthesizer? Like, you said that you wanted to know more about like what makes a Korg different from a Roland. Do you own these synthesizers? Are you interested in the hardware part of this story? No, I don't, but I do have access to the manuals and uh, some schematics. I will say more about this matter in a later. <laughs> Sorry for keeping this all in the dark, but uh, I do have access to some schematics and some, uh, pr- not to say presets, some of the uh, guidelines that are used on the various synths. And I would like to study them because each one has their own uh, architecture and uh, I would like to see how you can apply this sort of uh, architecture in code instead of a visual interface like how do you, how do you program an oscillator how do you create an LFO from scratch mm-hmm. and there have been uh, ways that have been haven't been explored yet I believe and have you ever heard of a plugin called Dean is Noise? I don't think so, no. Uh, this is a, I don't I think it's available as a VST or thing. I think it's a standalone only, but you can bridge it in a DAW. So this thing um, is uh, open source, but you have to pay for the builds or you can get the source code and build it yourself but you shouldn't distribute it. Uh, the developer said that uh, it's illegal. You have to pay for the build in order to support the developer, and I fully understand that. Uh, so this uh, thing, Dennis Noise, is uh, the most, maybe the most flexible synthesizer there is, but uh, it is uh, very peculiar to use. It's unlike anything you have ever seen. And uh, the possibilities of this thing is, is endless. And the possibilities are endless because it is not using the traditional ADSR envelope or this, but it is synthesizing using a Bezier curve. Ah, and, now that you say Bezier, yeah. Bo is here in the chat. He was on the call two weeks ago and he's here on the chat. I'm sorry to hear that you're not feeling super well, Bo, but. Oh. He, Bo was the person who asked me to implement Bezier curves on in JS effects in the library that I'm working on. So I think he's going to be interested in that because he is not oh. only thinking about Bezier curves as drawing, but also in terms of representing sound with Bezier curves. And you were talking oh, yeah. about synthesizers using Bezier curves for the synthesis itself. Yeah, I hope you feel better, Bo. Um, but yeah, this the the good thing about implementing a Bezier curve in a synthesizer is that the tones that you can uh, create are basically endless. You can create the smoothest pitch bend, for example, that you can think of. And that was way before MPE and uh, all the <coughs> sound were a thing. So this guy was uh, thinking ahead. It's just that it hasn't been implemented as a VST yet. And uh, I would like to create something similar. You want to use those curves for automation or as uh, waveforms? Both of those, a great question. Because if you're using a Bezier as a waveform, uh, think about using um, using it to create microtonality or polyphonic pitch bending that uh, can be as smooth as you can get. Right. What, what's the overtone series of a Bezier curve? If, is, it, is it infinite? I think so. I, actually, I used a demo version, a share, I think it's a light version of uh, Dennis Noise. You can get it for free. And I was a bit uh, dumbfounded by its interface. <laughs> I need to get the grasp of how exactly it does things. But yeah, I think you can achieve what you said. Um, and they, it has a feature called Pendulum, which is uh, all of the, uh, the interface is vector based. And you see those uh, pendulums. It may remind you of those arcade games in the late 70s that were using vector graphics. I, I, I don't yeah. know if you have seen them. Like the first Star Wars game back in 1977. This was a black screen with white vectors. 
and uh, Dean is using a similar interface, albeit with colors. Um, now let, let me see one final thing because I want to answer your question as concisely as I can. I want to visit the site again. I'm, I'm going to post the, the site in the Skype chat. It is dinisnoise.org. <laughs> Conveniently, that's and going to show up for people on the stream on top of your oh, face, great. so people can just go there. And yeah, the funny thing about the site is the website, the the homepage. It has a, a very ironic drop down menu that doesn't lead anywhere. <laughs> it doesn't take you. Maybe you can show this site, Leandro. Yeah, it's right here. And on top of our faces. So if right. Moog, uh, let's go Moog and Super Collider are so since then, <laughs> then it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean anything. You can put anything on those drop downs. But yeah, I like that its uh, philosophy is where it is. It forgets history, so it does not repeat it. So it, it doesn't try to emulate Korg or Roland or Yamaha. It wants to be its own thing. And so I have covered two different spectrums. So this is the completely forward thinking one. And the other one I said about the schematics is the more retro one. So I want to study both of these and see if there is some kind of middle ground something that uh, does have this forward thinking sound design thing but in a most more accessible matter that are people who are accustomed to regular synths like uh, roland can use yeah i guess by the way this this guy has made some live streams and he has made some uh, demos of how to use it if you're interested yeah, uh, is it on the website? Yeah, you can download the... Maybe under videos here? Well, what is it? Yeah, the, the free version, the evaluation version is in the download link. Mm. And it has a buy link that you allows you to... It, it is pretty expensive. It's $150. Or you can get it for free if you download the source code and compile it yourself it's quite an interesting business model it's the same people the, the same thing that the people who are developing ardor a digital audio exactly, workstation yeah. do and they have documentation on how to build but uh, i understand that it makes a lot of sense from uh like the perspective of like you're trying to make money but you do want to share the code it's kind of interesting because there is something that is at odds. You, If you have this business model, then you don't have any incentive to make building easier. But if, yeah. you are, if you want open source contributions, then you do want to make the build easier. So I guess they just probably use standard tools and people can just build. If you are a developer, it's going to be relatively yeah. straightforward to build. But yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's not usual. I don't find many pieces uh, of social yes. that do this. Yeah, speaking of this, and by the way, there is another uh, synth that, that uses the same model, the most famous synth for Linux. It's called Zenode SubFX, or so I always forget the name, but yeah, you can either build it from source or buy the build. But the, the neat thing about Ardor, have you looked into Ardor and its business model? Uh, did you know that there is actually a commercial fork of Ardor called Harrison Mixbus? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, they developed so the, along with yeah. the company, Harrison. Exactly. The neat thing about Harrison Mixbus and Ardor is that they coexist. And so you can either get the commercial one or you can get the open source one. And uh, the teams who are working on both of these are Sorry, <clears throat> they're collaborating with each other, and I think some of the people work on both teams. So it's nice to see that you see both a commercial uh, DAW and an open source free DAW, free as in speech, not as in beer, libre, not gratis. 
that is the term that they're, they're using. <laughs> uh, yeah, I heard this. Yeah, I, I, I was listening to this podcast by the person who develops Ardor, and he had Justin Frankel, who created Reaper, oh, as a guest. Great. And it's like a two and a half hours conversation, super entertaining. And Justin uh, mentioned this notion of freedom that I think applies here, and it's super nice. It's free as in puppy. <laughs> Of course, he didn't yeah. make up this, this joke, uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's like that. It's a responsibility now. <laughs> you will have to take care of this yeah. thing. You have to compile it. Exactly. Uh, Victor, would you like to answer the questions that Leandro said? Because I would like to then talk a, a bit about CLAP plugins and what is the future about CLAP. What was the question? Well, the first Just, is, what is your goal? What do you want to build or understand or... Okay, I don't have any specific goals, um, but it's, it's a matter of wanting to understand. Um, I use synths, I can code, I, I'm pretty good at math. In fact, that's my degree, uh, but I cannot bring the three together. So I want to know how all these concepts translate into code. So th that's my main purpose, just understanding. And then secondly, um, I do some stuff with live looping. So I may want to be interested in uh, coding my own loop station. And in particular, I, I loop with uh, melody instruments like a flute, which are monophonic. And so I sort of want to have something that can generate chordal accompaniments from a monophonic input. So I have a couple of vague goals, but initially I just want to understand what, uh, what is the relation between the math and uh, the code. Anything specific that you have in mind, like... Uh, any algorithm that you would like to learn about or any field of mathematics that you would see how can that be applied in digital signal processing? Um, no, just a matter of understanding uh, how do you do, how do you make a delay, how do you make uh, an EQ? Um, just just understanding where how... Uh, how the, how the code and the math relate to each other. I guess you're probably going to be more interested in filter design then. Well, how EQ works, because filter design has a lot of mathematics in it. There is um, naturally the Fourier transform, but also um, the Lagrange transform and projections from the S plane into the Z plane. And I suppose that being a mathematician, all of this is something that you already know but how to turn that into code and make it efficient and all of that is right. probably something that you would be interested in learning. Absolutely, yes. And um, so I'm, I, I use logic, but it, it looks like uh, you have to exit logic and reopen it for it to scan for new plugins. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure what happens if you recompile a plugin, if you can just dynamically reload it. Um, but uh, yeah, I was hoping to stick with logic, um, uh, but I can be persuaded to use to use other um, other hosts like the, uh, the, uh, the the plugin demo host or whatever it's called that come, comes with Juice. Um, and I've downloaded Reaper, but uh, I don't think I'm going to use that. Anyway, so I'm on the Mac with Logic. Yeah, I think that in terms of using Logic for development, it's probably fine. I know people who do that, and it's one of the most used DAWs. So if you are interested in supporting multiple DAWs, for instance, I am, all the things that I do, I want to support as many DAWs as I can. So in my case, I have a primary one, I think that is reasonable, which in my case is Reaper, but I also have Logic, I also have Live, I also have um, Audacity, all these hosts for VSTs um, and audio units, I suppose. So, yeah, it, it, logic will be fine. There is one or two quirks that you probably want to know about. I was reading some chapters from the book that we are following along, the C++ 
book by uh, Will and Will Perkle, I think is his name. And in the chapter yep. about audio units, so in that book, the first chapter is about like basic concepts of audio. And I really hope that everyone here will be able to understand that chapter. It's fairly deep. It kind of takes for granted that you know something. So we probably want to ask questions about that chapter, things that are not clear. But that is the first chapter. And then the next couple chapters are about the different uh, APIs, VSTs, audio units, AAX for Pro Tools. And in the chapter, I was reading the chapter about audio units. And one thing that stood out to me is that if you make any mistake in your code and you try to load it in Logic, your plugin will not pass validation. So Logic, when loading a plugin for the first time, will do yeah, some yeah. Uh, validation routines. And if you don't pass that validation, you're put in a block list. And the book doesn't mention how to get you out of the block list. I did a quick search online and I could not find it. So maybe the thing you have to do is just change the developer ID so Logic thinks you are a new plugin. But you may have no, run into if, that if issue. A does, if a plugin doesn't pass, uh, you can you can just rescan it. Yeah. Supposedly, I know that the, in Logic there is that wi <laughs> plugin management window. Right. I haven't really run into the issue myself. I was just reading about it, but it's something to keep in mind. Okay. Audio units are managed at a different level, at the operating system level, while VSTs are more like regular dynamic libraries that you get loaded into other pieces of software. But right. audio units are more at the operating system level and Apple does some extra validation, extra stuff to audio units. I see. Okay. So there is this yeah. tool that is a command line tool and I think it comes with Xcode, which validates audio units for you before you run them into the DAW. And they recommend that you always validate before loading, just not to have the issues of getting into the block list. Right. Is that, is that AU scan? I forget the name. You probably can find yeah. it by scanning the right. chapter about audio units yeah. on that book. Okay. Yeah. Another another host that I might be interested in uh, exploring further is Plug Bidul. Uh, it's uh, it's like a modular synthesizer where you you drag everything into the, the big field and you you wire it up and uh, so it's it's a it's a software modular system and um, it's it, it's pretty cool uh, i've used it in the past i might get, go back to this because it sounds like it might be flexible enough for uh plug-in development i i do have one question um are we all going to settle on on juice as infrastructure or how, how do we make sure that that we can actually talk about code and help each other out yeah so the great thing about all these different apis vsts audio units windows mac and blah, blah blah the great thing about them is that of course they have their quirks like we were just talking about a quirk of audio units but in the end of the day, they are all doing the same thing. They get a buffer of samples to process and they need to produce a buffer of samples. They all have two, at least, threads of execution, one processing audio, one with the parameters that you change on the interface. And you have to communicate yeah. them in a way that is already established by the API. So whatever API you are using, if you're developing AAX for Pro Tools or audio units or VSCs, the principle is the same. And the things that you are interested in, like the algorithms, understanding how the mathematics relates to the sound, all of that is independent of the platform. So if you want to use Juice, it's going to smooth out the differences between the APIs and it can just spit out VSTs and audio units and all of that. But if you want to just download the VST SDK or download the audio unit SDK from Apple and use that, or if you want to use something else that is a replacement for Juice and is cross-platform like iPlug, or uh, we talked about many of these in the previous meeting and I collected the links for them in the GitHub repository. So yeah. if you want to use something else, go for it. I will be probably using Juice because it's the most popular one. It's cross-platform and many people who developed using the lower level APIs, they say that, yeah, if you're starting off today, if I was starting off today, I would probably have been using Juice instead. That's what people say. So 
Well, so yeah. Juice gives you a large number of headers and utility files. So I understand that ultimately it's about processing a buffer, but there is a whole, whole edifice of infrastructure over that. And I think Juice helps with that. So, so if, if, if we all use the same infrastructure, then it's easier to, to talk and help each other with coding. Yeah, but but if you if we all that is true, but if we all explore different things like Fotis is exploring Clap, then he is going to see something yeah. that is different, and he can teach us about that, and we'll all benefit too. So I don't think that we should like prescribe a framework or even prescribe an API. You are maybe interested in audio units. You develop audio units. I am interested in cross-platform stuff. I go for that. So yeah, it's very free form. Sure, but you. Uh... You put Juice Study Group in the title of this thing. <laughs> I did, yes, because... It is and Juice. Yeah, I, I think that it okay. is the most <laughs> common thing that people are using these days, and therefore many people are going to be interested in that. But it is by no means a prescription. Even the C++ part is not a prescription. I mean, uh, Fotis just mentioned uh, pure data, right? And And that's... A different platform so if he's interested in doing that it's still digital signal processing right so it's still fulfilling yeah, the, the, principles the, are the, same. the requirements of the title so yeah and Fatis, you wanted to say something you raised your hand before yeah yeah first of all uh victor have you purchased blog b dude yes um oh it was not too expensive uh, i don't know a hundred dollars okay. or something I, I just wanted to com recommend an alternative for people who cannot buy it. No offense to plug, I love them, I support them, but I have, I cannot afford Bidul yet. But there is a free alternative called Bespoke Synth, and I love it. It is a free open source modular environment. It, it can function as an instrument, it can function as a, as a DW. And I really love it. I have, I am in their Discord. I have spoken to the developers, and I really like uh, its clean interface. I don't know if it is better or worse than Bidule in some areas. Maybe they're good at both. But the neat thing about it is that um, it was made by one person. In uh, he he took it took ten years for him to build it, and uh, it. I have used a lot of those modular things like pure data and the uh, voltage modular and what have you. And Bespoke is the only one that sucked me in from the moment that I loaded it. Uh, it, it just it let me, the way that it is structured, it made me want to experiment. It didn't want me to uh, get too confused with the interface. It, it, it was so made right from the get-go to get you started easily. I mean, I, I showed it to a friend who has no idea how modular things work. And I showed it to her and she told me that she completely understood how it works just by glancing over it with her eyes. So this is a... <laughs> okay, I, uh, I found it. Thanks for the reference. Yeah. You can use this in tandem if you want. Like you can uh, sure. load Bidule in, inside of Bespoke, so you can have infinite possibilities. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. And how about you, Tom? Yeah. Um, so I've got a couple of goals. Um, like Victor, um, I'm also more interested in the math side of things. Um, my background was in theoretical physics, so that's the kind of stuff that I'm that I really enjoy. Um, one of my goals is to make some kind of delay reverb VST um, that sounds good with the guitar. So I don't just want like a you know carbon copy of exactly what was put in. I want to apply some filters to it. I want to apply some modulation and I want to learn about how that all comes together. So that's that's goal number one. Um, the other goal is that I was toying with the idea of making a digital theremin. Mm. So you, you know how with theremins you just like put your hand up next to a thing and it's 
your hand acts as one half of a capacitor. So as you change your distance to the metal rod, um, the frequency of some analog thing and the yeah, the frequency of, of some oscillator changes. So you hear a different pitch. Um, I've got a a bit of hardware which enables me to get my hand position from um, three dimensional space into a vector. So I was thinking if I can just use that hand tracking software to and combine that with some synth generation, then uh, that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, so yeah I remember <laughs> that I I was working at some place at some point that had this piece of hardware. Maybe it's the thing that you have. You just it's like you put it on your desk and then you can move your hand and it's going to capture that. Is that the thing you have? What is it? What is it called? Yeah, so it's it's called like a leap motion camera. Yeah, that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I've got um I've got one of them here. So I was going to play around with it. Did you uh, enjoy playing with it when you had it? <laughs> yeah, uh, it was very early days, very early days. And back then it was like a fun toy, uh, a, a cool solution looking for a problem, you know what I mean? And I was into that. I am always into wacky stuff, but we ended up not using at all for our purpose at the startup. So there is that. So okay, when, I, when I, I felt when iPhones I, first came out, I uh, uh, this is too long ago for me to remember what I used, but there was some utility that sent uh, physical positions as MIDI signals, and so I sent from my iPhone to whatever computer, and then in Plug I uh, implemented the second derivative. And so the second derivative of position is acceleration. And so I, I could measure acceleration if I moved my hands. I could influence sound with that. So <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, yeah, yeah, so that, that sort of stuff is possible. Even just a simple phone can, can I don't remember what utility I was using, but I, I could get the coordinates into my computer. Yeah, I have this yeah. app here I, I, that can use the accelerometer to send MIDI data, and it's the very basic concept that you are talking about. Of course, your implementation is more interesting. I I I, I will say that the um, the quality of the of the hand tracking is way better than it used to be um, back in the day. So um, the recent stuff's quite interesting, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I just think it'll be a, a fun thing to do and then, you know, maybe change other um, aspects of the sound based on different things with your hands as well. So it's not just not just proximity of one point. You can actually control it in many different ways because of the data that you get. But, you know, that's kind of a, a separate thing. Yeah, the I technique that people actually use to, pay, to play the theremin to have control over pitch and not just do sci-fi sounds is with like tiny precise hand movement so you need to capture not just position you need to capture like very fine movements mm, yeah yeah it'll be fun to try yeah. and and let's not forget that experienced theremin players take years to perfect those movements with their hands i've seen an orchestra that only uses theremin like 500 people just moving their hands and they have to be perfectly uh, precise with their emotions because if you hear one person doing the wrong move you can hear the, the tuning and of course it's not just your hand it's your whole body so some of some theremin players look like they're frozen in place because if they would move their head it would also influence the sound yeah yeah, yeah I bet the theremin players would like that because when you're playing the theremin like everyone in the room needs to be kind of away from you. But if you're using lip motion, the range is very precise. So if you can get a theremin player have the same feel when they're using the lip motion as when they're playing the theremin, they could play in environments that they could never play before. That could be a lot of fun. Right, so uh, what progress did you make this two weeks, Tom, did you uh, download the APIs and compile the simple example plugin? And did you uh, skim over the first chapter of the book and try to understand all the concepts in there? Yeah, so um, 
I basically just made sure that I could compile the juice stuff, but um, I didn't like personally. I didn't really like using the producer and using Xcode and having to use the pre-made stuff. So I went via the CMake API, um, which works quite well. Uh, so I've got that all set up nicely um, with CMake and CLion project. Um, but when I was playing around with things like to, you know, uh, actually process some audio, I decided to use port audio instead because there's much less stuff in there. So like Juice does give you all this GUI and this ability to actually make plugins, but from for fun, I want to approach it from the other end, you know, from the let's start with with as close to the basics as we can and let's build up. So um and the good thing is that it's all compatible with Juice. So I could just make my own separate library that I just link against when I want to make a plugin. So um that's that's gonna be my approach when I uh, when I do this stuff. So Port Audio is going to produce a standalone app, not a plugin that you load into a digital audio workstation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so what I've done so far is I've made a a, a separate library um, in C, and then I've made a, an app which links against that library. So in theory, I should I, I could just make a um, a plugin which also links against that library. So all the common code is just um, in that one library that I make, and two different ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's going to process audio in real time. It's pretty much yes. going to be the same business that we are in when we're developing plugins for a digital audio workstation. Yeah, exactly. It just means that I don't need to load up my door and all that kind of stuff. I can just press something on the terminal <laughs> and via the command line, everything works. You know, I can just just a quicker um, iteration loop for me. Yeah, and I guess the appeal for you for using CMake instead of producer using uh, probably some other build to instead of going with uh, Xcode was that it is closer to the command line and to the things that you are used to, right? Yeah, yeah, a mixture of that. And also like it's kind of more transferable and it's things that I also want to, you know, learn more about as well. Like um, CMake and stuff is, well, there's a lot that goes on in CMake. Um, and it's quite a complicated thing. Uh, so having more experience just doing things with it can only be a good thing for me. And it, like, it's kind of industry standard in um, in companies that make things with, with C++. So I think it's like, yeah, a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah, great. And how about you, Suits? Suits? <laughs> um. Uh, I think I have uh, goals very similar similar to the Victor. Uh, the main idea of uh, my, let's say, work is to learn things, uh, learn how to uh, audio works in in the. Sorry, my English is not very good. Yes, it's fine. Need, need, need to use a little bit of translator. <laughs> it's okay. We can hear yeah. you and understand uh, you fine. Yeah. <laughs> how uh, I want to learn how everything works under the hood. Uh, and uh, yes, the, I have a couple of goals. Uh, one of them is to make a standalone uh, piece of gear. Uh, maybe some examples would be a KMPC live uh, and to able to take everything in the pocket in the bag and go somewhere and jam with other people to create music uh, somewhere else uh, outside the house to just plug my earphones and to, to, to make some ideas and record them. Yes, and uh, everything has to work with, I also have the beautiful controller from Ableton. It's uh, Ableton Push 2. Oh, nice. I really like it. I uh, have played a couple of times in Ableton and it makes 
Ableton easier to use with controller neither without it. So yes, for now I can load audio file in my program, play it. I can hear some music from the the brick of gear. And now now I'm trying to connect uh, push to the Raspberry that I have. Hmm. How how does that work? What's the protocol that Push uses to talk to the computer? I don't think it's MIDI. It's probably going to be something more specific and proprietary, right? No, basically it's MIDI. Hmm. Most of it it's MIDI for the for the pads, for the RGB lights, for every buttons and the pods. It's a basic MIDI, but there is a leap USB for the display. Mm. Um, it use some how it's called. I think in USB you have a couple of uh, protocols uh, built in to communicate between uh, gear. Uh, one of them is called bulk, like a B U L K. It is made for streaming big pieces of that data between the gear. And yeah, it's no, not very hard, I think. But basically, it's MIDI. Okay, that that's so, simpler yeah, but, but, but than it was uh, what I was expecting. <laughs> uh, one one of the interesting thing about push, uh, it. It is that, uh, how to say, wait one second, that de developers made things a little bit open source. So you can find on GitHub a uh, couple of uh, manuals uh, how to work with push mm. from the other applications that you, you can Use use it as as you want, and this is very interesting. I think no, for for me basically. But yeah, ma main goal is to learn things to, to to improve my coding skills and uh, yes, something like this. Yeah, processing real time audio is a skill that is very different from most things you would do in programming because you have to think about performance you have to think about real-time constraints and it's okay, definitely a different kind of muscle that you exercise in this space even if you are already used to c and c plus plus it's somewhat different also the the interface design gets more tricky because if you're doing uh, real-time stuff what while you're playing uh, you're limited in how many hands and feet you have available, which is why I have a big pedal board so that for every function there is a button that I can stomp on. <laughs> yeah, I have one of those. I made it on the stream yeah. using Arduino. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Arduino is more, more, more simple than Raspberry. Yeah, definitely. It's also <laughs> cheaper and it was just perfect for having some buttons I could press and that's yeah, that. Yes, of course. I have, in the past, I have made a MIDI keyboard uh, from Arduino Mega and it, it works great. So yeah, I can play MIDI on my computer. Right, great. So let's move on to questions that we may have i i have some questions about the c plus plus part of things because i generated the project using producer i also looked at some other plugins like surge which is a synthesizer that is open source and there is a lot that i don't necessarily understand about the language but i know that you all understand c plus plus or some of you are uh, 
very knowledgeable with C++, so I would like to ask some C++ questions, but also some of you may be newer to the digital signal processing part of things, and I have some experience there, so I could try to answer those kinds of questions. So do you all have questions that you want to ask? Plus questions. No, I just got my stuff to compile, so now I'm going to dig into the code base and see what what uh, all this, what all those headers and utility files are. That uh, and uh, Juice still has a couple of tutorials that I need to work my way through. So, sure, but uh, you said that you know the mathematics of things, but you don't necessarily know how uh, it applies to the code. And uh, did you work your way through, or at least scan the first few? Uh, words on that book because there are uh, sorry <laughs> no that's fine but uh, the terms that we need to uh, that we need to know when we are talking about audio things like sample rate beat depth and um, conversion to db what does it mean to say minus 13 db and the Nyquist frequency and DC, all those terms that people just throw around like it's nothing, a filter kernel, uh, impulse response, all those terms. Are you all familiar with this or are you like reading the first chapter or reading anything about digital signal processing and you're like, hmm, this is a foreign language to me? I'm sure Tom and I will have no problem with that. More, more or less, yes. Yeah. Me neither. I... I'm using DSP almost every day. Awesome. So I have a basic, yeah. Just to throw something out, Gibbs phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, so is that a well-known term? I, I've never heard of it. OK, so uh, watch my camera. If you, um, uh, if you make a square wave, and it is an actual square, then it has infinite partials. Uh, so if you want to make a square wave additively from finite uh, partials, then it has some very nasty looking zigzagging at the end of the uh, at the ends of the stair. That's the Gibbs phenomenon. Well, the Gibbs oh. phenomenon is that uh, the the size of the wiggles does not decrease as you use more partials. I think that's it. Anyway. Um, yeah, so if, if you if you make a perfect square oh. wave and it looks nice, it sounds horrible because you get aliasing effects. So a yeah, nice aliasing, square yeah. wave does not, sorry, a nice sounding square wave does not look nice anyway. That's Gibbs phenomenon. Oh, I would like to add something to that. So, uh, yeah, Victor just mentioned aliasing by square waves. So the thing is that uh, most uh, basic synths can alias because they are using those pure waveforms and all of them can be prone to aliasing. But uh, there are some techniques uh, such as uh, using filtering to reduce aliasing. Them, everybody knows the term anti-aliasing from graphics but few people know that it can actually upload, uh, apply to audio as well. And the other way you can deal with it is by using a more complicated oscillator, such as the one that the guys at Surge synthesizer are using. If you load up Surge, you have the option to use uh, a, two different types of oscillators. The one is the basic one, which can alias, and the other one is the modern, uh, did I say that in the previous uh, uh, live stream? No, I don't think so. I don't so. remember. Okay, uh, please let me find the link. It was in the GitHub. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this is a documentation about the second oscillator type that Surge uses, which is called the modern oscillator. And they are calling it uh, polynomial differentiated polynomial waveforms. And this uh, document is showing how an anti-alias synth can work with this code. And it explains right, how so, they're doing So aliasing it. is one of those things that I understand mathematically. And now I would like to know, how do you do that in code? 
yeah you can see that and uh, my my buddy chris from air windows has been applying his own kind of anti-aliasing he's currently experimenting with various filtering techniques and i think that what you're doing here is uh, have you ever heard of oversampling uh, you're basically calculating more than the sample rate that you're on and that uh, can also help alleviate the aliasing problem yeah but it does require more cpu yeah victor you may be interested if you if you want to have an oscillator that does an alias then there are plenty of techniques but if you are doing some other kind of processing that is just consuming audio and producing audio like uh, saturation and uh, many kinds of distortion and even some kinds of compression all of those can alias as well and then pretty much the only established solution is to oversample and we did talk about this a whole lot with Justin Johnson on uh, a stream I guess in January, early January, mid-January over here on this same channel. So you may be interested in watching our conversation with Justin because he explained how he does uh, oversampling and how he does the anti-alias in filter that he designed by himself um, for uh, an equalizer that re -EQ. Re EQ that he created. So you may be interested in doing that. Uh, we went into the code, we talked about how to implement the filter, and we talked about how to make it fast, which is important. Nice. Is that stream preserved somewhere? Yeah, it's over here in this channel. Just go to the videos and look for Justin Johnson. And um, if you don't find it, then I can send you the link. I'm sorry, I'm only looking at the chat. Where did you post this? Ah, okay, yeah, I can I can send the link to you in a moment. But yeah, okay, so I didn't talk about my goals and my <laughs> hey. uh, my experience this week. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about that. So my main goal is to well of course, I have a big list of things that I want to do, but my main thing, the thing that I want to do in the study group is a plugin that is called an auto mixer. I developed a flavor of that in JS effects, which is this language simplified version of C that exists in Reaper only. And I would like my auto mixer to work in every digital audio workstation. So I'm planning on re-implementing my auto mixer in C++ Using Juice, uh, that's the tool that I decided to use, but of course the core of the thing is something that is going to translate to any other framework. And the reason why I want to do an auto mixer is that there is no open source auto mixer as a VST that I know of. There are some commercial solutions that are not open source and they, uh, I think it's just lacking because it's a super useful effect people don't tend to give it much thought. And people using other DAWs may want to use it. So what is an auto mixer? Suppose that you have a podcast situation or a round table, or even this kind of meeting, if it wasn't for the fact that we are all over the world and there is a coronavirus, if it wasn't for that, maybe we could be in the same room and each one of us would have a microphone in front of us. And the thing about unscripted situations where there are multiple microphones is that everything that you say will be picked up by your microphone and every other microphone in the room. And so there is a lot of bleed. There is a lot of crosstalk between the mics. And what an auto mixer does is it is going to, well, mix the microphones in real time. So that can be used in conference scenarios where you're just PA in the discussion. And of course, it can also be done in post-production. And what the way that the auto mixer works is super simple. It was the first effect I developed in JS effects. It's just such a simple algorithm. And yet no one did it as an open source VSC. And the way basically it works is you take the average of the microphones and whatever microphone is louder, you give it more gain. If the microphone is not contributing too much to the overall sound, you take its gain down. 
So the cool thing about this is that it's not based on gates. It's not based on expanders. There is no notion of attack and release. It's just take all the microphones, add up their signal, and then take each microphone, divide by the sum, that is the gain that you're going to apply to that microphone. So microphones that contribute more will have more gain allocated to them. So the effect, the sonic effect of an auto mixer is that it is as if there was only one microphone in the room and people were passing the microphone along. This has desirable properties besides just the crosstalk elimination that I mentioned. If the microphones are picking up some noise, then you use, and if you use something like expansion or gates, you will be modulating that noise. When no one's speaking, the gate is going to cut the signal and the noise will go away. When more people are speaking, the noise will be, will be occurring in every microphone in the room, so you'll hear more of it. And typically, people are good at ignoring noise. But if the noise is being modulated, its volume is, bring, is being brought up, up and down, that people can hear and it annoys people. It's a annoy very annoying thing. So an auto mixer, super simple algorithm. I just explained and you all probably know what the auto mixer does and how it works, and yet it doesn't exist. So that's my main goal, to produce a VSC that does auto mixing for every DAW. And the challenges in there are not necessarily the algorithm itself, but the routing. You have to make sure that all the different microphones are going into the VST and you have to process all of the signals in one place. And there, there's definitely a way to do it. There are plugins that do this. There are commercial auto mixers, but it's not something too common. So it's probably gonna be kind of interesting. And ideally, my auto mixer will also have visual feedback of what it's doing to the audio. So I imagine each microphone being a waveform, stack of waveforms and some gain reduction um, graphs in real time scrolling along. So you can calibrate the parameters and you can see the effect that is happening to the audio. So yeah, and in terms of progress this week, I did what most of you did. I downloaded the SDKs, I compiled the template, the uh, example code, it worked, and that was that. <laughs> and I also read about, uh, I read the first chapter of the book and worked my way through all the concepts. And most of them, I think, uh, we talked about at one point or another in these live streams over the course of the last year. Yeah. So. Excuse me, I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Sure. And then in terms of questions, I actually do have some C++ questions if you all uh, want to talk about that. I think that what, I, what we should do is, I already committed and pushed on the code base that is for the study group. And by the way, uh, if you want to share your code, then there is somewhere where you can do that. Uh, go there and just push the code that you have. Like I would love to see some code that is using Pulse Audio, for instance. And um, even the audio unit that you're developing, Victor, I would like to see that if you want to share that. But, sure. so here is the producer file, and you can see that I'm not using Xcode. I think that if I open Xcode, then the stream will go down because it's just too much. Xcode is huge. But we, I think that what we should do is go over these four files that Juice produced for me, because that is going to cover the basic concepts that are present, present in pretty much every API that you use. The concept of getting a block of uh, samples to process and then producing another block of samples and the concept of having a user interface with controls and all of that is in these four files. And there is a lot of C++ that just doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So how do you feel about going over this real quick? Sure. 
Yeah, so I guess the first question I have for people who know C++ more than me is, there is a header file and a CPP file. As far as I understand, the point is that the header file will have some definitions that can be reused in other code, and then CPP will be the code, the implementation itself. But there are some things that you can do in the header file, like if you implement a method here, it will be available in line. It will be in line by the optimizer. And so my question is, what do you usually put in the header file? What do you usually leave for the CPP file? C++ is kind of inelegant here. Uh, the header file needs to have um, the whole signature of the class, all the public methods, and even the private data. So that, that is kind of inelegant, which is why people have found a way around it. Um, but uh, so basically, um, so for instance, void paint override, that's the signature of the paint method. And then the actual code of the paint method goes in the CPP file. So the header file has the whole class name, the name of all methods, name of all variables, even the private ones. Yep. Right. So um, in the CPP file, you then have void class name, colon, colon, method name. And that is the implementation. Yeah. So my question is, what is the point of having the header file? I know that it can be reused in other places, and I know that there are even some libraries that claim to be like header-only libraries. What's the story uh, there? Okay, so um, the point of having a header file and implementation separate is that um, if the implementation doesn't change, you don't have to recompile it. So if you have a main file, that uses 100,000 lines of implementation code and there's a, and the, the, the main file is only 10 lines and you make a change in that, um, then you only recompile the main file and not the 100,000 lines of uh, implementation details. So, so for speed of compilation, header only, um, I don't think I have to explain it now, it's, it's a little tricky, it has to do with templating and it doesn't look like uh, Juice is using templates, at least here. But uh, if you use templates, then you're sort of forced to put everything in header files, which means that your compilation time just goes through the roof. Mm. There is a way around that, but as I said, it's a, it's a bit much detail. And what is the advantage then uh, of putting things in the headers and using templates. I suppose it's going to be, you, it takes longer to compile, but it runs faster in the end. No, it, it takes longer to compile, and uh, it, it's a necessary evil if you want to use templating. Mm. So I'll just, uh, I'll just add to that, um, if that's okay. Like, sure. a, a good rule of thumb would be, always put the implementation in the CPP file and not the header, unless you've got a good reason to. Um, with templates, I don't feel like we're probably going to be using them in this um, in this stuff, so I'd, I'd probably leave them alone <coughs> now. But um, yeah, I, I, I agree with Victor saying it's a necessary evil to, to, to you know, have to define them in, in the header. And you mentioned uh, that uh, it's like a necessary evil and that sort of thing. And and I know that people say that C++ has all the features and people tend to use a subset of features that they end up liking and thinking they are more useful and avoiding other features. So in terms of using versus avoiding when it comes to templates, do you use avoid when and why? That's a, a, a difficult question. Um, use them when they're the right tool to solve the problem. Um, but they are like not beginner friendly, you know what I mean? So um, I guess like what a template, one example of what a template could be is that if you want to make a class which wraps around a certain type of object. So for example, if I want to make a class foo, which contains um, an integer, 
right? So my class foo has one member variable int x. Um, suppose I then want to make another class foo, which contains a floating point number point instead number. of an integer. The way you do that in, or one way you could do that in C++ is to make a template class where when you construct the class, you say whether it will be holding an integer or a floating point number. So that's one way of doing it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> probably not the most useful example. <laughs> and it would go something like this, right? So you would define, I don't, I'm not sure I have the syntax right, but the point, the intention is that I will define a template here. So now this whole class is a template and I receive as an argument what the number type is. So when I want to use this class later, I will use some sort of syntax that I know I don't know, like maybe something like this to say that this is a version of food that is using an inch. That is precisely the right syntax, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what you do. Yeah. Oh, oh, awesome. So but, it's similar to how well, generics you, would work in other languages. Yes, but if your class is a template, then it has to be in the header. Ah, I see. All well, the implementation details would have to go so. here as well. So I would not have a CPP file that implements a method. I would just inline the implementation of the method right then and there. So Tom, if if you know in advance for what types your templates will be instantiated, then you can put that in the implementation file, compile it yes. once, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the stuff I didn't want to go into. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That, yeah. Makes sense. Right. And I have an, uh, a related question when it comes to organization of the code. Um, and if you excuse me, I will draw some comparisons to other languages that I know. So if these are languages that you may not use or may not like, or you don't even know how to answer the question, then uh, feel free to, to correct me. But typically in languages that have object orientation as their primary source of or way of abstraction, you have one class or file and you name the class and the file with similar names. That's a convention that people follow in Java. It's a convention that some people follow when using Python. Not always, in most cases. In Java, it's even enforced by the compiler. In C++, it doesn't seem to be the case, or at least the Jews people are not doing that because they call it plugging editor. And, and this is not plugging editor. This is example plugging audio, blah, 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 blah. So what is the convention or what is the ethos of the community when it comes around to naming Organize people prefer big files with lot of lots of classes. Do people prefer to break things yeah. apart? I don't think there is a convention. Um, I have one project that I'm working on, for instance, I have all my. Uh, it's about linear algebra, so I put all the all the utility classes and routines in one file called utils. I put all my vector manipulation, so vector addition, vector inner product, God knows what in a file called vector and then I put all my matrix linear algebra in a file called matrix. So there is no convention, whatever you are comfortable with, really tiny files or really big files. I find big files more, more convenient for editing. Okay, okay, so it's free form, it's not mandated by the compiler and there is no strong Correct. community convention around how to do things. Yep. And not even in terms of naming I, I, things. Like, for instance, I see here that they are using like processor editor at the end. So it seems like it's using some sort of Hungarian notation. And I, I have seen that in other places, uh, like in the VST APIs, <coughs> probably in Juice as well, they have K as a prefix for constants and that sort of thing. Can you speak to that? like in terms of naming conventions and that sort of thing? No, that's more a matter of house style. Okay. And yeah, just so for your interest, people who are on the Skype call right now, I just pasted the link for the conversation I had with Justin Johnson, where we talk about, Thank you. besides uh, j just the EQ part, we also talk about the oversampling and the anti-aliasing filter that is in there. Right, so, uh, the thing to note about these four files is that they are defining two classes. The classes inherit from 
parts of the juice framework. So the way that you use the framework is by extending or by inheriting from the framework. It's reused by inheritance, not by composition. And these two classes have two distinct purposes. They will run in separate threads of execution. The editor is responsible for the user interface, the knobs, the sliders, the parameters that you expose to the DAW. And the processor is the thread that is doing the audio in real time. And the programming style you would use in these two is somewhat different. You are much more concerned about the performance and the real-time constraints in the processor. For instance, one thing that you want to avoid is to use locks because you cannot guarantee that the lock will release in time for you to compute the next sample. So if you have any sort of communication that needs to happen, you need to do it in some other way uh, because you don't want to acquire a lock. While in the editor, it will probably be fine because you don't have the real time constraint. So you end up producing code that looks different because it has different trade-offs in these two environments, so to speak. And uh, I know that most of us are new to real-time audio processing, but are you also new to the notion of real-time constraints and to the notion of this, this weird style that you have to get into, like you cannot use locks and uh, so lock-free programming and that sort of thing? Or do you have experience doing that? I watched a, a couple of video from CPPCon on YouTube a few weeks ago where they explained about all of these type of things, um, like not using locks and um, how to make lock-free algorithms using atomics and stuff like that. And that was, that was really interesting. I um, haven't had much experience implementing it myself, though. Right. I understand the basics. I hope to bring it in practice. Okay. Okay. Uh, because, of course, real-time... Uh, processing of audio is far from being the only real-time environment you would get into, right? Like you could write that in that style with the same kinds of constraints when you are doing um, some robot or you are doing some, I don't know, magical application or some computer that is going to go into an uh, airplane. All those environments sort of have similar constraints and guarantees that you have to make. Right, so uh, let's start with the plugin processor and let's do a, a dive here into what they have, what the Juice framework produced for me because the processor is going to, of course, define a class and this class is inheriting from Juice. And let's go here sort of method by method and understand the whole life cycle of the plugin as it gets loaded by the DAW and when it's ready to process audio and all of that. And in the process, we can talk about the syntax because like, what is this? And what is that? And and so forth. So let's start with this. What is this? Can, can you all school me on why you would want to have this pragma here? Oh, if your header files get too complicated, one header file includes another one, includes another one, and you can get a circular include, which would hang your compilation. And so you have to make sure that a, that a file gets loaded only once. And this is the modern way of doing that. Yeah, so I guess my question, I understand that. Uh, it's if you have the same header being loaded multiple times, you probably don't want to redefine stuff multiple times. So my question is, what is the reason for having this? Why is this not the default? What is the use of letting the header be loaded multiple times? That's the way original C allows it to, to happen. Mm. So it's not necessarily that you would want this. So I guess, you're going to see this pragma in most headers or something that amounts to that. Yeah, you'll either see the pragma once or if not defined something, usually the name of the header file, then define it and then, yeah, ends the if statement at the end. However, um, it's, I, I believe, I don't know too much about it, but C++20, which is coming out soon, has modules, and I believe that will 
I think that replaces the pragma once so that you don't need to do all those things, but you, you might need to do something else instead. I haven't looked into it yet because I can't, can't use it, but <laughs> yeah. Right. Last time I tried it, my compiler didn't have it either. By the way, um, may I remark that <laughs> just as a complete aside, that Fortran had modules 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so C++ is not intrinsically more modern than Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know people doing audio in Fortran? <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, no, never there heard of it. There must be some people. What do you use Fortran for? Fortran. I know that you, Victor, you probably use Fortran, right? Um, in science, it's used left and right. Um, so, for instance, uh, the Department of Energy, which manages the, uh, the, the nuclear stockpile, as it's called, uh, they are sitting on codes that are 30, 40, wait, uh, wh whatever years old. And those were written in Fortran. And it's still dependent on certain communities. So, for instance, weather prediction and climate modeling, uh, all the big codes there are written in Fortran. So, and for modern Fortran, meaning the 2003 and on standards, are actually quite nice. They're object-oriented. You can operator overload and all, and all that stuff. So, in essence, oh. to crunch numbers, all the various kinds of numbers, but yes, mostly yes. crunch Fortran numbers. Is pretty much, Fortran is pretty much science and engineering. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess we yeah, are in the business the way, of crunching I, numbers too. <laughs> Different numbers. Yeah. 40s? Uh, I had a friend who was using Fortran, and uh, he told me about the differences of doing a simple math calculation in other languages compared to Fortran. And he said that uh, making a thing that takes you five or ten minutes to write in C or C++, it may take you an hour to write it in Fortran. Uh, or, the, uh, or the opposite way around. I oh. mean, if if I want to assign to a two, uh, no, to a five-dimensional matrix, um, only the, the odd rows, odd columns, odd whatever. So um, that is a one-liner in Fortran. Oh, nice. But he said that the main advantage of Fortran is that you are closer to the code, if uh, that makes sense. Not sure what you mean by that, but... Yeah, I, I don't know how to explain. Basically, that I know that I, I think he meant by that it is super flexible in that kind of way. Everyone, I don't know, it. yeah, I don't know what he meant by that. By the way, I would like to later talk about club plugins if you, yeah, if you're okay with it. Yeah, sure, sure, I sure. Posted the link. Okay, <laughs> I posted so the link chat. here comes the moment of truth. So yeah, um, what we know about club? Oh, sorry, but do you mean do, do you mind uh, if we uh, finish this exploration here? Because sure. I think we should all yeah, yeah, at least yeah. know the life that's cycle what, and the nature of a plugin. Yeah. And it would be nice to clear up some of the questions about yeah. the syntax. So yeah, this is defining a class. This is inheriting from the audio processor in Juice, which means that most functionality from this class is probably going to be provided for us. Uh, I guess that's the point of inheriting here. And then this is a constructor that doesn't do anything. And this is a destructor that doesn't do anything. So what's the point in declaring these guys? Or maybe the, the thing is that it's going to be implemented here and then you will be able to like allocate memory. Is that the point of having these guys here? What you are pointing at is this, the fun function signature in the header file. Yeah, but I mean this. Yeah, I, I read this code before. That's why I said the destructor is not doing anything, for instance. Is this just like a oh, placeholder yes. or is it like a magic that you need to have this here so that the destructor for the parent will be called something like that? In that case, I think I think that that destructor is is just the placeholder. Okay. Um, as long as the 
Jewish audio processor has declared that destructive. Now, there is a subtlety with destructors and inheritance. Um, but I, 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 I do assume that the Juice audio processor has declared its destructor is virtual, in which case it should be okay. fine. Yeah. Yeah, so tell me more about this. Uh, what is the effect of having something <laughs> as a virtual and a destructor as a virtual in specific? Everything so I ask if, makes Victor laugh. Why is that? Why is that? It's like because uh, no. C plus plus is complicated, and you're about to dive into uh, specific stuff. Uh, sometimes C plus plus is not just complicated; it's tedious, and um, I, I don't think this sort of stuff uh, uh, is terribly relevant for DSP coding. But yeah. Okay, so I'm sort of I'm sort of surprised at all the overrides. Does that mean that the uh, the the method in the base class is not pure virtual? I didn't think that's what it meant. I just thought that putting override was something that you could you could always put override on there. Right, right. But um, if if I were if I was designing a framework, I would make th th that sort of methods, the ones that you expect to be overridden, I would have made them pure virtual. Does that mean that you can't put override on them? Because no, if I... it, means, it means that they don't have a base definition. Yeah. That, yeah. that you're only saying these have to be defined in the user co code. But I'd still put override on there anyway, just to make it clear uh -huh. that you are right overriding something from from the base or this is they are pure virtual i don't use this often enough okay I, I i always put an override on something if it inherits from override over something in the base class even if that is pure virtual um it's not necessary but it does make it easier if you're not looking well to save you from clicking between different files all the time okay what is a pure virtual Uh, pure virtual is a um, a virtual a, a function which doesn't have an implementation. Ah, okay. Um, so if a, if a function is virtual, it means that um, it will delegate to base classes if you're holding a pointer to that type. Um, if it's pure virtual, it just doesn't come with an implementation, so you can't create objects of that type. Okay. Uh, so like base classes in other languages. So it means that that kind of object is or that kind of class is supposed to be inherited and then that method is supposed to be implemented by the children yeah precisely yes you're forcing your children to to provide an implementation okay so to make a an analogy it is like an abstract in languages like java probably i don't speak java <laughs> okay uh so and then we get it's a little like the Sorry. That's in Python. Oh, sorry. I was I was just going to say it's um I, I I also don't do Java, but it's a little bit like the abstract base class um library in Python. If you've used that. Okay, I I personally have not, but yeah, I'm trying to draw analogies for people who have backgrounds in these different languages. Yeah. So this little symbol means a destructor, but the construction and destruction of this object, as far as I understand, is not in our hands the plugin host will be responsible for uh, allocating and then freeing the object for us. We just have to define this. So in a typical C++ program, you would start the program in the main function, but that's not the case here. This is going to be loaded into a bigger application. So I think that this is like the entry point and you don't really have a lot of control over how this object is going to be allocated and even, not even like how many of them, I don't think, right? Yeah, I think that's correct, yeah. Yeah, and then there is this funny business going on here, and this is the constructor for this. So the funny business that is happening here is if this flag has, been, has not been enabled, then... The, it's, it, this stuff is going to happen. So 
I don't really get what's going on here. I, I understand the idea that it's going to set up the pins of the plugin. So is it going to receive audio, send audio? How many channels of audio? Is it going to be mono, stereo, 5.1? And But I don't really get the syntax of what's going on here. So I know that these are macros or not macros, but preprocessor uh, stuff. But is right. this like so inheritance again? Yes, um, uh, either inheritance or constructive delegation or setting of uh, what's it called a uh, member initializer list. So it has something to do with initialization. So if the preferred channels are not set, then uh, your example plugin audio processor uh, gets an initialization step where the where I guess it, <laughs> this syntax can actually mean multiple things. So, Great. Yeah. So either it's either it possesses an audio processor which gets created like that, or it inherits from audio processor, and that is how it calls the base method on it. But it's a, it's an initialization step. So line twenty four and twenty five, you see that the actual body is empty. Yeah, uh, this is somewhat weird to me because it looks like it's calling a function. I mean, this looks like a function call, but this context doesn't really ask for a function call or a method call, however you want to call it. Well, um, I think what's well, what's going on here is like the um, those preprocessor macros will be, the way they work is they basically just like discard the lines from your source file or keep them in when you go through like like before compiling so you can basically like delete them and see what it looks like and then you can see you've got this audio processor open bracket buses properties open bracket close bracket so that makes an object um called buses properties or that function will return something then your line 18 is dot with input so that's calling a method on the returned object and then the same one line 20 is doing the same thing it's it's calling a method on that and i so i think the way that juice does this is they define those constants for you based on your um configuration of the producer and stuff like that or your cmake flags i believe i'm not 100 sure on that so that when you compile it you just it just Links down to exactly what you want, right? Yeah. Right. So I guess that's another question I have because it's that thing that I deleted. I did the job of the preprocessor, so we could look at the clean syntax you were referring to. But the preprocessor is going to look at all these flags, and where do we have the opportunity to set these flags? That I don't know. I believe it's within the settings of the producer. Or within the CMake code. Okay. The CMake okay. So that's what so, I was yeah, so asking. I, uh, so it's going to be something set by the build system, and you would set these uh, things as kind of arguments when using the preprocessor, when the build chain is going to call the preprocessor. Right. So so producer has a whole bunch of checkboxes, and I think I've I've seen checkboxes for MIDI input, and so if you if you use producer and you tell it this thing accepts MIDI input, then that flag that you've highlighted will be set to true. Okay, but if I was not using producer and I wanted to have then, then my own flag, flag how the, would I how would I use that? If I am using CMake or even if I'm calling the preprocessor by hand on the terminal. You know. Right. So you have to go hunting for the for the .h file or HPP where that thing is defined. Producer only gives you an HPP file with all those settings, so um, you you just have to go chase where that, that thing is defined. Mm. And what is the difference between an H file and an HPP file? Again, just convention. Okay, great. I, I use .h everywhere, but some people to uh, to indicate that it's a C plus plus header file, they use HPP. Okay, okay. That makes sense. And the compiler, 
Pilot doesn't care. Yeah, and I guess this piece of syntax here, not, so when I see column something on the class, I see that as inheritance. But when I see column something on the method, I guess I don't, I cannot make sense of that. I don't really know what's going on. And the consensus is that we don't know what's going on. Um, can you show me side by side this code and the uh, the class header? That that makes the difference. I want to see them both together. Yeah, this is yes. the header. Okay. Okay. So the audio processor inherits from the example plugin. Audio processor inherits from audio processor, and so the constructor of the example plugin audio processor needs to call the constructor of audio processor, and that's what it does with line fourteen. Mm. So this sort of like. Yeah. Uh, this is code that gets executed when you call the constructor for this guy or when you instantiate the object. So it is similar to what I would imagine happens here, but th there is special syntax in the <laughs> definition of the function. Yes, yes, that happens beforehand is like, yeah, the stuff that happens in the in what's called the initializer list is done before what happens in the inside. Um, so like you can guarantee that by the time you get to your constructor on lines 24 and 25 the base class will have had will have been constructed appropriately with the arguments on 15 to two okay that makes sense right. and and this this is a quite common idiom that in the constructor that the body is empty and everything is done through this Inherit, inherited constructor or other initialization things. Okay, that's interesting. Right, but then the other interesting thing about the constructor is that the constructor is not responsible for the setup that I would expect from a plugin. That is the job of the prepare to play. <laughs> Uh, function or method. Do people usually call these methods or functions? I believe methods. Okay. Yeah, or class methods. <laughs> class methods? Yes. I would think of them as hey, object methods, but they are class methods? <laughs> oh, good point. Um, hey, by, by the way, it's two o'clock. I'm signing off. I'll see you in two weeks. All right. Okay. Okay. See ya. <laughs> Bye. 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 Yeah, okay, so the job of the prepare to play is to do the initialization that I would expect. So in this case, the prepare to play isn't doing anything, I don't think, if I remember correctly. Prepare to play, yeah, it's not doing anything. But this is where you would do initialization that I typically associate with a constructor. So that's a, a core piece of the life cycle of a plugin. And I guess this happens yeah. here because of that whole validation that we talked about, some contexts will instantiate this class without the intent of really processing audio. It's just validating if everything works as it should. So it may, I don't, I don't know, may not need to call the prepare to play. Does that make sense? Um, I wouldn't, I'd need to, to, to actually see what the AU stuff does and what the validation does in order to answer properly, but um, I think your intuition's right. Uh, I usually would expect there to just be a constructor which deals with all the preparation. Although, maybe it's because the prepare to play method needs to know the sample rate and the number of samples that you're getting per block, and maybe that's something which it doesn't know when you um, construct the constructor. So, well, yeah, when you construct the object. So, yeah, I don't really know. <laughs> well, another thing that is kind of interesting is that maybe when the sample rate changes, because that can happen, right? You may have a session open in your DAW, and then you go and you change the sample rate in your settings. Maybe that process will not destruct and reconstruct the plugin. It will just call this prepare to play with a different value, and you are responsible for all the shenanigans you need to do. Could be that. So it could be, yeah, it could be. Um, that's probably how they've done it in Juice. But yeah, 
Yeah. I mean, without knowing the underlying um, AU and VST APIs, I wouldn't be able to say for sure. But yeah, I mean, it's probably prepared to play gets called whenever the sample rate or sample split block changes. Um, but yeah. Or maybe even every playback, because it's talking about playback. So maybe if you start, if you start, it's going to call this. And if you stop, it's going to call that. So that's something interesting. We could try to yeah. uh, make sense of these two and see, uh, check when they're called. Because release resources sounds a lot like uh, the job of what a destructor would do, release resources that have been allocated. Yeah. Right. But then all of this is just preamble. This is also preamble. So this is a method if you have different channel configurations. Channel configurations are just like mono versus stereo versus multi-channel, uh, 5.1, 7.2, these sorts of things. So if your plugin wants to do that, and I guess Foti's plugin will want to do that, then you need to implement these extra methods and do some extra work when uh, maybe to declare that these other configurations are available and to adapt to when you have the plugin loaded and the number of tracks the number of channels in the track changes. But the meat of this is this. That's the method that does the real juicy stuff. See what I did there? Process block. <laughs> yep. So let's jump to dash. And OK, so for instance, this is just us setting things to mono and stereo. That's not interesting. This is an interesting process block. So we get this buffer. And it seems like Juice is treating samples as floats. That's something that the first chapter of the book we're following kind of touches on. So it seems like it's preferring to use floats instead of doubles. And that is kind of surprising to me. I thought that at this point, everything would be using doubles. Do you have some insight on why they are doing this? Or maybe a guess of why they're maybe doing this? Um, so I did notice that the default when I was using port audio was floats as well. Um, it's worth noting that uh, not all hard, hard hardware support levels. Um, I know that like some very, very, very small chips like need to have floats instead of doubles, but I don't know if that's the actual reason. Um, floats are just smaller. Uh, I, I don't really know. <laughs> okay. My, my guess would be that um, because you're only going from the range minus one to one, then uh, maybe floats just give you enough fidelity and they've decided that you don't need to use double precision over that region. But again, that's that, that is just a guess. Yeah, okay. And in terms of syntax, this is saying that this is an audio buffer. The audio buffer could be of different number types. It is a float in this case, but I suppose it could we could maybe change this to a double if we wanted. That's the intention of having 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 this. And this is necessarily a template. When I see this syntax, can I tell for sure that it's a template or this syntax happens for other reasons? Uh, yeah, that's definitely a template. Okay, and Fatih's raised his hand. Oh yeah, I wanted to ask about this uh, doubles versus floating thing. Uh, Reaper is using double precision, right? 64 bits. Yeah. Um, the thing is that if you are um, implementing double precision on your VST, you should expect your DW is doing the same. So if you are using a DW like Ableton, which I think uses uh, 32 bits internally, that you shouldn't uh, use double precision or you're running into excessive uh, CPU consumption. Mm. Interesting. And do you think that maybe they have this as a template so that you can try to detect what environment you're in and then use different data types depending on the context? Uh, I'm going to repeat this phrase a lot, but my friend Chris from Air Windows <laughs> is currently is currently exploding. I am um, he's currently explode exploring. Sorry, this as we speak. So his uh, plugins are always dithering to the floating point. point. Uh, he's been doing some calculations lately on his website, and he created a new plugin that is using uh, uh, long doubles, I think, which is. Uh, 
can alleviate this sort of uh, CPU issue, and it can work better on the uh, on the DW such as Reaper. Um, you can see the first two posts on the airwindows.com website, especially the second one, which is about hypersonic, not the one hypersonics. But in hypersonic, he says that uh, he's running an internal bus that is uh, one trillion times um, resolution. But uh, if he's using, <laughs> the, the numbers are really long, but you can see it for yourself. OK. Uh, I'll check that later. And okay. yeah, so we receive a, a buffer with numbers to process. They are going to be between minus one and one, uh, unless the thing is, of course, clipping. In that case, it will be greater than one. So we always have to keep that in mind. Sometimes it's greater than one and less than minus one. And depending on what we are doing, like a filter, doesn't really matter. Depending on what we are doing, like a limiter, it matters a whole lot. But we also receive some MIDI messages, which we may decide to ignore. And then there is this trick. This line is very cool. It's a variable that is not used in the block. But as far as I understand what's going on here is that it's protecting against denormalized numbers. And I guess that's one of these concepts that we are agreeing that we don't need to explain again, but if you don't know what a denormalized number is, uh, then you should ask. But the, it's protecting against the normalized number, uh, and it's a setting. You can decide to use the denormalization protection or not. If you want to use it, you just declare this, and this variable is not going to be used anywhere. It's just that this variable exists here, and it will go out of scope there when the method finishes running. So the uh, allocation and deallocation of this class is going to do uh, something that is going to set the uh, flush to zero flag in the processor to protect against the normals. So the point, and, and of course, the destructor is going to reset that to the previous value. So the this is a very cool trick that I guess it's probably idiomatic of C++. I have never seen anything like this before. Have you seen this before, Tom? Uh, I haven't, no. Um, but I mean, yeah. no, I haven't seen it. I'd have to look at the code and to, to figure out what that does, but that does sound like a cool trick, yeah. Yeah. And typically the way you would do that is you would have like a function that you call to enable denormalization protection, something like flush to zero or denormals are zero. And then at the end, or when you are, you want to reset that, you would call some other function. But no, they are just using the constructor and destructor as kind of a neat trick here. And then uh, this is getting the number of channels because we may have different configurations of channels, maybe mono or stereo. And then there is this obligation of uh, putting something into the output. If you don't put anything into the output, it may be garbage. So even if you don't want to output anything, you have to make sure that you clear the output buffers so that they are the of the zeros. That's what this is doing, but we probably would not want to have this code in our real plugin. So, so uh, one thing I will say is that um, with that kind of like um, objects existing and something happening for throughout their lifetime, that's um, one of the ways you can acquire mutexes in, in C++ is by creating a lock object which acquires the lock when it enters scope and releases the lock when it goes out of scope. So, I mean, this is kind of a similar thing maybe, though, though in that situation, you need to pass it the mutex in the constructor, but here it's just using a default constructor, but yeah. <laughs> interesting. So I guess that is an interesting point. Here in the audio thread, we need to be aware of locks and we probably want to avoid them. So anything that we use, we have to inspect to see if it's lock free. And I guess that's one instance, right? Probably they know what they're doing here, so we don't need to check. But if we are using some other library or some other method, we always have to check, is it lock free or not? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Right. So it seems like the way that this API works is you're getting the input samples to process over here, and you are going to transform this buffer. And then whatever samples you leave there at the end, that's what's going to be the output. That's what it seems to me anyway. Yeah. And this is, sense. so, uh, and by the way, this syntax means pointer two, right? Uh, no, that means, uh, right. So the ampersand can mean different things depending on where it's used. When it's used in a, um, in a function definition, like for example here, it's, this is taking an object of type audio buffer floats called buffer, and it's taking it by reference. So mm. it's basically like taking a pointer to it and immediately dereferencing the pointer. So it, it makes this thing mutable so that what if you change it within this function, then you're actually operating on the objects that you passed in and there's no copy involved in um, in this, yeah, in, in calling this function. Okay, uh, if I didn't have that here, then it would try to make a copy of the object as it's passing into this method call? Uh, yeah, exactly. But if you did this, then it wouldn't compile unless you did the same thing in the header as well. Oh, naturally, yeah. But that, that, that would pass in um, an object of that type and then uh, or a copy of this thing. Um, you make changes, it goes, it goes out, it goes out, so it wouldn't do anything, you know. I see. So I guess that's one of the fundamental things about how plugins work. The whole point of a plugin is that it's going to be loaded into the address space of the main process, the host. And the way that the host and the plugin communicate is with these buffers that you receive with a reference to instead of receiving as a copy because it's much faster to transfer data this way. The host can put a bunch of numbers into a buffer, give you the reference to the buffer, you change the buffer as you see fit, and you're, well, that's it, really. You don't have to return anything back to the host because the changes will be there. You just mutate the buffer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, uh, so this part is kind of interesting. It's, it's just looping over the number of channels that you have. And then auto is just a way for you to declare a variable without having to say it's type. Like for instance, this is going to return a number. So you can say auto and yeah, this is a number or an integer in this case. Uh, and, and, and yet, it, we are not using auto here. Is that because a zero can be a zero in integer or a zero in floating point and that and so forth? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then this is an auto pointer. So we are getting a right pointer into the buffer to write on that channel. And this is where we would mutate numbers. So yeah. I that um, using the auto star there is a choice. Um, I don't think you you need to call auto star. Um, it just depends on how you want to use it later. Um, basically, yeah, if, if you call auto, I, I, I think this is right. If you call auto star, then um, it acts like a, yeah, then you can just, I'm not sure actually, I'll have to double check that. But I believe that the only difference between auto and auto star is whether you need to use dots or whether you need to use arrows later. Ah, that's a good point. So if I want to call a method, now I have a pointer to this, uh, well, I have a right pointer to into this buffer, into this channel in particular. So if I am doing something like this, it means that I have an immediate reference to that, to the channel data. But if I am doing the arrow, it means that I have a pointer to that object. Is that the difference? Uh, so, I mean, if we made an, a, a new variable, let's say int star, uh, maybe not, maybe not an integer since that doesn't have any methods, but okay, like if, if we had a, a, something called foo and we had a, uh, a line, which is like foo star f. So if, if we declare a, yeah, so we've declared an object of type foo, um, 
yeah, if 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 we put an F after this, then sorry, yeah, uh, at the end of that line, could you put an F? Yeah, hello, there you go. So this is making this is declaring a pointer to an object hello. Sorry, no, that's wrong. It's declaring a pointer to an object of type foo, which you can use via hello. If you wanted to call a method on hello, such as I don't know, X, then you'd have to do hello arrow bracket X. Exactly, yeah. Uh, however, if you just declare, declare a variable of type foo, so if I say foo F without the star, then you just need to call F dot X. Um, and that's the kind of syntax of, of, the, of the two of them. Uh, okay. Though I, yeah. I don't really know this difference between auto and auto star. I'll look that up. Okay. And I guess this is the main place where, if our goal is to do something that is besides just the hello world, this is the place that we need to change. And there are more methods here about the life cycle of the plugin, but the most important things we covered: how we the object that got constructed in the first place, how the object declares some of its properties, like the number of channels that it has how the object acquires and releases the resources that it's going to need and how the object processes the data. And then how to do the user interface, how to deal with this um, state that you may have. Like if you are doing a sampler, you may want to store the sample or any kind of data that you want to keep around for the next time you close and reopen the session. That's what happens here. And there is a whole thing about declaring uh, or instantiating the editor, which is the user interface. And there are references back and forth. So you have a reference in the user interface that points to the audio thread, you have a, re a reference in the audio thread that points to the user interface. So there, all of this is ceremony around the most important thing. And I think we covered the most important thing and some of the most pressing issues in terms of syntax. So everything that in this file it should make sense with a bit of effort, like these are macros, these are implementations of a function that has been declared over here in the header, this is uh, passed by reference. And yeah, um, I think this... Um, just to go back to the auto star thing, okay. um, I, I just Googled it. There's absolutely no difference between the two of them, apart from the compiler will complain if you have the star and it doesn't return a pointer. Oh, there you go. So, okay. yeah, it's, it's, it's just a, a matter of taste. And uh, yeah. Okay. Right. So, with that, I think that I will leave. I, I don't want to discuss necessarily the nitty gritty of how Juice is doing everything. We may not even be using Juice for some of the things that we do. But I do want to circle back to Fati's points about uh, Clap, and then we can decide what we're going to do for the next two weeks. So uh, the most things we know about Clap is from a KVR forum thread, which was created by uh, uh, Oros Heckman, who is the lead developer and owner of uh, Uhe, I think that's how you call them, U Dash He. They are the creators of uh, many famous VST synths such as Diva and Hive. And so and they have in Zebra, and they have been around since forever. And the thing that um, a new open source standard is being endorsed by a company as big as them is, is a very is great news. So Clap aspires to be a be all end all solution. And I remember that in our previous uh, live stream that we you showed that a great XKCD comic about the competing standards and when you create a universal standard you actually create more problems. And that's precisely what they want to avoid with Club. And I'm actually going to read aloud. I'm going to post in the chat as well. Uh, a post by John Swartz, who is the other co-developer of Reaper, along with Justin Frankel. 
and he says about talks about the problems of uh, all the uh, plugin formats up to this point and how club can change anything so i'm going to give you the cliffs notes version so vst2 is a simple interface he says john vst2 is a simple interface that is easy to understand and is somewhat extendable but it was originally extremely incomplete vst3 is a different interface model that is familiar to some programmers uh, but they're completely unfamiliar to others and it's a proven model but if you're not familiar with it it looks confusing and intimidating lv2 is a fine design but uh, it has a problem with the separation of metadata and implementation and i'm going to post another link here in the chat about why the good the bad and about the lv2 format basically the lv2 aspired to be what clap aspires to be but uh, they failed and uh, yeah so um, the neat thing about club is that it came right around the corner that steinberg has tightened the noose on uh, vst2's neck because in, in october 2018 steinberg officially dropped support on uh, vst2 and uh, a month ago, they did they did it even uh, more strict, and in, in that it's actually illegal to sell a VST2 plugin nowadays. Uh, you are forced to use the VST3, which comes with its own sorts of uh, limitations and problems. And the guys who are make working on the search synth team. Are, have said that they are very frustrated about the VST3 SDK. Uh, they say it's a total mess and they are forced to use it because search only comes in VST3 now. Now, the good, cool thing about CLAP is that uh, all those people are aboard, like uh, Urs Heckman and uh, the Bitwig guys, the Reaper guys, the Ardor guys. Um, people, sorry, I don't want, you want to use the word guys, it's just stuck. Anyway, um, but they have also made this experimental extension which allows you to migrate uh, a project from Zeus to Club. I posted the link. Um, and this experimental implementation in uh, the Reap in an implementation in an inside an implementation so it's an kind of an inception thing so the dear in gui which has been uh, implemented in reaper as part of repack remember i have referenced it in a previous live stream of leandros and uh, john swartz the other guy from reaper has posted the um, github repo on how can you use it and the other problem is that I've seen a lot of people who are mute, who are still want to use 32-bit VSTs and other discontinued stuff, and they won't be able to load them in their browser. And CLAP aspires to be as completely agnostic as possible. It aims to be not just a universal format, but also as a kind of bridge, so that you can migrate other plugins without all the hassle um, and one final thing i wanted to say about club please give me a second uh, let me find it the post because that uh, that kvr thread is like 40 pages long but i think i found something equally interesting in the vi control thread which i will post also in this chat and here they are talking about club as well and yes if somebody also posted the same xkcd comic that leandro posted yeah everyone so knows about that one the same page <laughs> yeah um now yeah uh, now i remember the thing is that juice was created by a company called raleigh uh who i think also were involved with the creation of MPE and they have created the first MPE compatible MIDI keyboard, this Rolly C board. But uh, Rolly has uh, shut down as a company and Juice 
was acquired by Pace, you know, the guys, who, the people, sorry, the people who are making iLock uh, anti-piracy software. But, but judging from what I've read, the Juice developers who are still active, they haven't been compromised by Pace, luckily. But, uh, so it should be easy to uh, implement, to, even if we're not going to use Juice, if we are forced to use it or somehow. Uh, Club should be uh, a way of making things much easier. Um, and sorry, I'm stammering again. Uh, I wanted to say one final thing about how Club could be beneficial, uh, but I'm still looking at <laughs> the threads. <laughs> Uh, do, uh, do you yeah, think that uh, Juice being it's open source, so yeah. it's GPL. It's not even MIT. It's GPL, which is a very oh. strict license. So my question is, I know that now there is a different company who owns the right. So if you want to use it for a commercial purpose, you have to pay. A, if you want to use Juice for a commercial project, you have to pay some licenses. But uh, it, now the yeah. money is going to different people. But do you think that is going to affect the development or even the community adoption of Juice? Um, I maybe I actually haven't been uh, very. I I haven't followed the com the development of Juice lately. But uh, the neat thing about Club is that it will actually actually be MIT licensed. Great. Okay. Yeah, that is a good good news. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, uh, there is something to be said about GPL as well, um, in terms of freedom of software. But we don't need to necessarily get into that discussion now. Circling back to the more technical aspects, do you plan on using Clap or experimenting with Clap for your synthesizer? I would love to. Yes, but I have started their GitHub repository. I am. I'm closely following what they're doing. And if uh, it, it takes a bit more, if it becomes a bit more complete, I yes, I would love to use it. But um, I have no problem with using Juice and learning it because I think it will still be a great gateway, especially since there is basically no documentation on Club yet. Mm -hmm. So, and the response of, uh, documentation and tutorials on juice yeah sure so uh, yeah right so for next week or for next meeting which is two weeks from now um i think that the plan should be to have something that compiles but something that does something interesting something closer to what we want to produce so for instance i want to do an auto mixer something that i will need to do is to compute the RMS of an audio signal. So maybe... Oh, yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. What is the question? Yeah, about AutoMixer. Um, are you going to measure the RMS only? Um, have, have you checked into um, maybe comparing the different kinds of lots, like uh, integrated and short term? Yeah. Um, it's not... So the difference between RMS and LUFS is that, well, there are two. The first is that LUFS is filtered. You take out some of the very low end and you also attenuate some of the um, very high end because people don't hear those frequencies as much. In other words, it is filtered to resemble the shape of our, uh, the frequency response of our ears. And the second difference is that it's integrated over specific periods. So 400 milliseconds and, and uh, three seconds and overall in the whole audio. So I don't think that it is going to have too much of an effect in the context of an auto mixer. I think that the results would be pretty similar and computing RMS is cheaper because you don't have to compute the filters. But that said, it's not by much. It's not a big difference. And it would be fun 
mentioning that idea of just wanting to understand how things work, it would be fun to implement LUPs, to implement the filters, to implement the integration, and look into that. And of course, RMS is also integrating over some time. So there is already integration there. So it could be fun to implement that. Maybe I will. I don't know. Yeah, it's something to consider, definitely. But not for two weeks from now. The only promise I will make is that the plugin will not be only the Hello World one. And I will look into how to compute RMS. Maybe Juice has a block for that, has a, an object for that. I expect that it has because it's such a common algorithm to want to implement. But if it does, I will look into how to use it. If it doesn't, I will try to implement something like that. RMS is relatively easy. I have done it before, if I know how it works. So that's my plan to implement something like that. And uh, how about you all? What is the little something in the direction of what you are, of your goal that you want to accomplish? Uh, I think I'll make um, a C++ library which isn't in juice and be able to make a plugin that links against it using juice. Mm. So I've got my own library to have fun with, um, use port audio, which has, you know, well, have a port audio interface to that library so that I can play with things in the command line, but also make a, a juice plugin which links against it. And maybe I'll add a simple um, one second delay where you can, you know, it doesn't try and uh, play the original signal and the delay signal. Just start with something simple. It will just delay the sound by a whole second or something. That sounds like fun. Yeah. You may be interested in looking into the history of this channel because I talked a whole lot about circular buffers and delays. In fact, just yesterday, Arya and I from IDDQ channel, uh, IDDQ D channel, uh, he was on our last meeting too. And we were working on our delay plugin that is in JS effects, but it does implement the core of what you need to do, which is to have a circular buffer, hold on to some samples, replay them later. And we are even doing our own spin on the thing where the delay tabs are at particular times so that if you just send some audio to it like a transient, it's going to sound like a ping pong ball dropping, like tick, 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 tick. So it's a ping pong delay that is a really ping pong ball, not your typical intuition of what a ping pong delay is. So yeah, you may want to look into that. And uh, and how about Siwitz Siwitz? Uh, what do you want to do for the next meeting? Oh, I'm struggling with the rendering of image of a waveform on the push display. And I will try to get this one works pretty well. And if I could do this earlier, I will try to implement some uh, low pass filters, maybe. Okay. Maybe if it will be possible for me. Of course, I want, want, want to read a bunch of C++ uh, books, uh, a bunch of pages of the first book I'm reading now. And yeah, I hope I can do this. Yeah, I, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but you, you also want to go over the history of this channel because we have implemented low-pass filters and we have implemented waveform drawing as well. But in, in terms of low pass filters, we implemented the most basic one, which is just a moving average. And that was the first stream in which Aria and I coded JSFX together. We also did the RBJ cookbook formulas, which is like the one that most people use because it's the simplest to implement and it works very well. I also implemented SVF filters, which is different flavor of implementation, but same flavor of filters, two pole filters. So you may want to look into that. Okay. Thank you for the suggestion. Uh, obviously, we'll look yeah. in that videos. And with Justin Johnson on that same link that I posted before, of course, we implemented a finite impulse response low pass filter, which is an anti aliasing filter. So 
that's probably not the filter that you would want for uh, the kind of thing that you are doing, but it's still interesting to know about Fotis. How about yourself? I want to do everything. <laughs> uh, so my goal for next for the next live stream is uh, to use. I just posted another link. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a YouTube playlist by the audio programmer, and um, it's a series of twelve videos where he creates a synth with juice from the top ground. So I will study this one. I will try to follow all of his steps and uh, understand how the basic synth creation in Juice works and let you guys know what what my results were yeah. and what I got out of this. Great. So to reiterate what I said before, there is a repository where you all should have access to at this point. If you don't, then uh, go on the board or uh, maybe even here on the Skype call and send me your GitHub username and I will invite you. But the point of this repository is first, I am collecting the notes from the meetings. And if you want to share your code here, that would be great. I have here a plugins folder where I made an example plugin with the thing that I did. I went into producer, created a project, and I put the project here. That's the code that we looked at during this meeting. And uh, I also have here under documentation, the meeting notes, and I am collecting all the links that you all send. So yeah, make sure that you have access to this if you don't. Let me know and go in there to look at the meeting notes and also share over here the code that you end up producing if you want. And yeah, with that, I think that's all for this week or for this period of two weeks. <laughs> yeah, I will definitely post my code there when it's done. Great. Yeah, feel free to jump into my notes and change and uh, and improve on them. Yeah, so. Okay. Any any final thoughts? Yeah, okay, so uh yeah. Go ahead. I'm I'm basically blank. The only thing that I wanted to say is uh should we create separate folders in this uh, group about uh effect and uh instrument plugins because you know DSP is about effect plugins. But uh, Juice and the VSTs are a lot more of that. Uh, you mean in the repository if we create different folders? Yeah, if, if we create different folders, yeah. I, I don't have a preference. Do whatever you want. You have push access to the repository. Okay. Do what you think is best. Um, yeah. Okay. It's our repository. It's our space. We can do whatever we want there. Yeah. Great. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, it has been lovely to learn and, and learn from you and learn with you all. I'm looking forward to our next meeting on a Tuesday, two weeks from now. So let me check. That is on the 1st. It is March 1st. Right. So March 1st at 6.30 UTC. I hope to see you all there. Have a great two weeks and let's keep in touch in the Discord. You too. Over here on Skype and, and uh, yeah, everywhere else. See you around. Thanks for being here. Bye. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Bye.